Hello, good morning, good day, good afternoon, everyone. Good evening and welcome to this last rest, uh, round table on the e-poster discussion. Um, here with my colleague, Higan Nagrat, I'm Steffi Stefanova. We're going to present, we're going to moderate uh, that session. You're going to present uh, our presenters, which are online uh, from, we have 12 presenters and the audience, I believe, will be interested in that uh, sequence of presenting the e-posters. We have e-posters from two topics uh, of that s and uh, I'll just list them. Topic 4.5, which is the resilience of the CTBTO monitoring regime, including the lessons learned. And the topic 5.1, which is science in policy discussions and scientific lessons learned from other um, organizations and arrangements. So, um, just for the audience, I would uh, repeat how it will uh, go, uh, how the session will go. Each participant, each presenter will have two minutes to promote the poster. Uh, they might present some slides, uh, but everything within the two minutes. Then the questions will go to, uh, from the audience and uh, if you have questions here from the audience inside the, the stage, we'll go at the end after all presentations have been done. Um, to the presenters now, just one uh, remark that we had this morning, please don't use video recordings because uh, there are problems with the streaming sometimes. So just if you want to present uh, your poster, use some slides, but no videos. Uh, yes, uh, so we'll start with the topic 4.5, uh, which is the resilience of the CTPT uh, uh, monitoring regime. This topic was already covered by a seri series of events. We had two special events. We had uh, one oral session followed by a panel, and now we have the poster presentation on it. Of course, we could not skip that uh, topic in the in this worldwide situation now and we had many participants that wanted uh, to participate many that contributed one way or the other and uh in the e-posters if uh, you go to the um to the vsnt uh, platform 4.5 e-poster topic you'll see that there are 30 posters there 30 posters uh from station operators different institutions, universities from Australia, Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Costa Rica, Jordan, Kazakhstan, Kenya, Namibia, Nigeria, Portugal, Russian Federation, Thailand, Sri Lanka, United States, and also presentations from the uh, CTVTO. In total, 30 posters. Uh, eight presenters are here with us today, this morning, we have time, to present uh, and we'll go um, straight on the presentations. We have limited time. So for the presenters, uh, stick to your two minutes. In total, we have 50 minutes for that session. And uh, to start the presentations, we'll go with uh, Ronnie Quintero from the Observatory of Volcanology and Seismology of Costa Rica. And Ronnie's going to be presenting station operator and impact of the COVID-19. Ronnie, the screen is yours. Uh, greeting from Costa Rica. You are hearing me? Yeah? yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, and uh, the, at this moment, I'm the station operator GTS, the uh, uh, secondary station here in Costa Rica. And um, well, with this uh, pandemic of COVID 19, we are missing this uh, get together. But uh, as my friend from Ethiopia, Atala Yen, said, this wonderful technology that we have today and we are sharing today uh, make this a uh, globe uh, a small village. Uh, that's why we are connecting and trying to to learn from each other. Costa Rica being impacted by the COVID-19, we had led to the university closing facility. This is one of the points that we as uh, we have delayed all the operation with the uh, GCI um, this at, uh, contractor in Costa Rica, but uh, in, anyway, we are uh, working hard. Uh, uh, all the data is uh, 
is uh, flying, uh, is, um, is going to, to the CTVT, and this is the important. Uh, we are, uh, the main goal is to keep uh, the GTA station working, and it has been uh, done until now. Uh, the only problem that we have is, uh, well, we don't have uh, much time to get together, and this is a problem, and, and the closing facility by the university. But you can see this in, in this poster, in the poster uh, that I, I mentioned here. Thank you. This is uh, what I want to say about this uh, e-poster. Thank you very much, Ronnie. Uh, the next presenter will be Carlos Eduardo Bonfin from Army Technological Center in Brazil. I know Carlos. Uh, Carlos Eduardo, are you with us? Hello, I will present for him. Uh, hello, my name is Brando. I don't know if you my screen is shared. I am the second author. Can you we had your we had your screen presented. We don't see your slides. Is the internet connection which is not too strong? Yes. Okay, we can see you now. I'm here. Yes. So, hi, my name is Brando. I am the second author. Carlos is from Army Technology Center, Brazilian Army Technology Center, and we did this work together. So. This work aims to address the measures adopted by Brazilian Arm Technology Center and Seismological Observatory of Brazilian University for the conductivity the activities during the global pandemic. So this pandemic imposed several situations that had to be adopted. One of the biggest challenges during this pandemic was adopting the work during the quarantine. For this, we used some tools to minimize the problem. In the Seismological Observatory, for example, we, it's part of the university, and when when the first the restrictive decree appears, the class, the face-to-face -face class, was totally closed, and we start to work at home, and we use this time to do the winter course, which many people from different countries participate, professors and students, and we use this time to wrote a book. And it's available in this QR code and it's free. It's Portuguese. It's really interesting. So if you have the, any questions or suggestions, please come to my e poster. And this is it. Thank you. Thank you very much, brother. Uh, very interesting. And for sure, uh, the book will be of uh, big interest for many here and uh, from the audience related to the CTVT. Uh, so, Let's go now to the third presenter, which will be uh, from here, from the from Vienna, from TV video. It's uh, Pablo Tristan Cruz. Hello, Pablo. Hi. Good morning. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, I'm here to present my poster. Uh, uh, can you see my poster? Yes, you can. Okay, cool. Uh, so um, I'm here to talk about the challenges and lessons learned that we observed um, um, in the perform in the conduct of the Radio Nuclide Particulate Network uh, QAQC program last year, 2020, which was significantly affected by the COVID-19 pandemic all uh, all around the world. Um, so every um, every year, uh, the PTS uh, requests on a quarterly basis uh, a, sa a random sample sample from the from each of our regional Clyde particulate stations um, to monitor the performance of the stations. Uh, of the IMS ne uh, Radio Nuclide Network, and because of uh, the pandemic of the COVID nineteen pandemic, uh, of course, the shipping, transport, and analysis of of the samples uh, during uh, for the QAQC program was significantly affected. And uh, what is interesting, what 
what is interesting for us is that although it was um it was expected and you will see in the poster that uh that the shipping and transport times of qaqc samples were indeed affected by the pandemic by the global response to the pandemic um uh, we did see um significant efforts um uh, with the, uh, from the station operator and the laboratory side in particularly in the analysis of the of the QAQCs of the QC samples, we actually did see imp um, improvement in the in the analysis time compared to previous year. So um, I invite everyone to uh, to visit my my e poster, and if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. Thank you very much, Paolo. And going uh, from here to Nairobi, Kenya, with uh, Joseph Atmolva. Okay, and Joseph is going to be presenting operation and maintenance of KNBO primary IMS seismic station in the wake of COVID-19 pandemic. Please. Uh, hi everyone. So welcome to our poster entitled Operation and Maintenance of KNBO IMS Primary Seismic Station in the wake of COVID-19 pandemic. So in Kenya, the very first travel restriction on, on April 6, due to COVID-19, coincided with the long rain season. And KMBO, which is a, a remote IMS primary seismic station, experienced mains power outages and voltage fluctuations. So one of the problems was rainwater dripping into the tunnel, and this caused short circuiting, burning of electrical sockets and fuses resulting to prolonged power outages. But uh, other than the rains, GCI UPS was not supplying backup power to GCI equipment as would be required because the threshold had been set very high at 96%. And that meant every time the GCI batteries dropped to 96%, then the GCI link would be lost. And so this led to numerous communication outages, data gaps, and outages as well. So there was need for travel restriction exemption for the SOs to conduct uh, um, operation and maintenance activities. So the, it's a tunnel type station. So what I'm showing here is the tunnel which houses the IMS equipment. And this chart summarizes the chain of communication so that uh, the SOs could be granted the travel restriction exemption, and you can see, of, of course, starting with the station operator and IDC operations, and then it was upscaled to CTBTO executive secretary and the Kenyan permanent representative in Vienna, and then cascaded downwards to other organizations. So this snapshot just shows you the performance of GCI batteries without a voltage regulator, and you can see every time it drops to 96%, then the link is lost and data availability is zero. So on two different days. And this data availability during the, the long rain season. And this is the performance of the GCI UPS after installing a voltage regulator. And what you see here, the capacity of the GCI batteries dropped to 96%. GCI link is maintained and IMS data availability is at 100%. So welcome to our imposter for discussions on short-term as well as long-term solutions to power issues at KMBO. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joseph. It will be very interesting to see also those slides from closer so that we can see the scales and the, the information from them. Thank you very much. So the next presenter will be Caitlin McLean. Good morning, Caitlin. It's, we know it's a very early morning for you. Thank you to be with us <laughs> from Indianapolis. And Caitlin will present the importance of blockchain and nuclear verification as a solution to reporting hardships in times of crisis. So two of the biggest disruptions seen during the COVID-19 pandemic surrounding reporting hardships were those that resulted from backlogs and communication avenues via post and air, as well as temporary halts to in-person activities. Therefore, this study sought to analyze whether any technologies existed that could minimize the impacts of these types of stresses on the nuclear verification system in the event of future reporting hardships due to crises. The main question I wanted to look at was, can blockchain help nuclear verification go uninterrupted in times of reporting hardships? 
Blockchain was established in 2009 as part of the underlying technology for cryptocurrency, specifically Bitcoin. One of the key aspects of blockchain is it does not rely on the physical transportation of data, data, but can be done in a secure digital environment that can easily be accessible to anyone who has the authority to operate on this system. Therefore, blockchain can act as another layer of verification by being able to track nuclear materials, even if regulators are unable to conduct physical, physical verification measures in person. Thank you, and I look forward to people's questions and or comments. Thank you very much, Caitlin. It was something different from the IMS stations, but also uh, relevant to that uh, that situation and how we cope with it. Thank you very much. So the next presenter, again, we have Brando. Uh, we are with you again for your presentation on. Um... Brando is going to present now on the influence of the reduction of human activity due to the pandemic in the identification of infrasonic events by IO9BR station. Please, Brando. Hi, everyone. I am Brando. I am a master's student from Seismological Observatory of Brazilian University. And the Brazilian Infrasound Station is a ray composed by four elements. It is located in Brasilia National Park. And every year, this station detects signals from different azimuths. And after we start to monitor the infrasound sources, we identify the main fixed sources like cities, airports, mines. And a few days after the first confirmed case of COVID-19 in the city, the governor decreed the first restrictive measure. The isolation rate reach was around 60%, reducing the cultural noise near the station. Here we have the scatter plot for a month before and a month later from this first decree. Due to the reduction of the human activity, the infrasound station better detected the low frequencies. And here we compare the same period, but in different years. The station detecting low frequency signals and related to, to, distance, to distance sources. So with the seismic monitoring, 1,127 explosions were found in 2020, where two, 229 were identified using infrasound technology. So the reduction of human activity in Brasilia, the, this station clearly detected more mine blasts than previous years. If you have any questions or suggestions, please contact me. And I'm here to answer you. Thanks. Thank you, Bruno. It was a uh, good side, a positive side from the COVID pandemic, but uh, hopefully it will be over and the station still will be able to detect uh, events. Thank you very much. We go to the next presenter, uh, Gonzalo Antonio Fernandez from uh, the Observatory San Calisto in La Paz, Bolivia. And Gonzalo will be presenting on a simple web scraping tool for state of health monitoring within COVID-19 times. Please, Gonzalo. Now the question is, is Gonzalo with us? Probably not. Okay, so we'll go to the next presenter, uh, which is Nicolau Wallenstein. Good morning, Nicolau. Uh, Nicolau is from a uh, station operator of the infrasound station IS. 42 in Azores, Portugal. And Nicolau will be presenting IS-42, COVID-19 breakdown operation and maintenance constrained in the Azores Islands. Please, Nicolau. Hello, good morning. Uh, IS-42 is a Portuguese infrasound station uh, located in, at Preciosa Island in the North Atlantic. The Azores are an outermost region of the European Union with great discontinuity and with important constraints in terms of accessibility and public health resources. We monitored and analyzed the evolution of COVID-19 pandemic between March 2020 and June 2021 in the islands that could affect IS-42 operation maintenance actions and compare them with the situation near all the Azores and mainland Portugal. COVID-19 pandemic forced the authorities to, and our institution to take severe decisions of confinement and restrictions of mobility and, and, uh, and mobility, sorry, that affect our task of operation and maintenance. We present a time series diagram with the evolution of the pandemic in the Azores with the daily number of active cases to which we overlaid the periods of restrictions to access to the lab and to visit the station, as well the data availability that never went below 99.81%. We also overlaid the pending issues and the new problems that occurred on the same period. 
presenting the delays in the troubleshooting and solution. With the support of PTS, some issues were the quick solution, but there still are problems to solve. We managed to find some alternatives to overcome the limitations imposed by COVID-19, but two major problems um, that can lead to a non-mission capability status of the station are still pending. As expected, all the processes were slower from our side as well from the PTS, in particular from MFS into 2021. We believe that some of these problems can be solved quickly and with less workload to MFS with a different approach in the PCA contract or optional expenses category. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please visit my poster. Thank you. Just trying to Thank stop. Thank you very much, Nicolas. Okay. Welcome. Uh, so that was the, the last presentation in the topic of the resilience of the IMS monitoring network. Um, for the audience, also don't forget uh, those 23 posters more in that same topic. And also there is the discussion room that can be used as well and also the chat of the, um, the live stream if you have questions or you want to discuss uh, on that topic with the presenters. And then we'll go to the next um, next topic, which is the science in policy discussion and scientific lessons learned from other institutions and organizations. And um, in that uh, team, we have 19 posters also. Five presenters are here with us. Uh, they're going to present their posters in a moment. Uh, but in addition to those um, five posters that we'll see uh, in a moment live here, we have um, many universities and other organizations which presented on that same topic. And the list of countries, again, is uh, very long in Bolivia, Germany, India, Indonesia, France, Pakistan, and Venezuela, and several posters uh, from some of those countries, which are again on this um, link of the VSNT platform under 5.1. Uh, so we have also um, the present the poster from Ambassador uh, John Bernhard from Denmark. We have CTBTO Youth Group presented as well. Uh, as international organizations, we have the OPCW. We have two speakers uh, now with us today, and also the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research and the Biological Weapon Convention, both in Geneva. So, also a large uh, um, spectrum of experience, expertise, and topics under this um, theme, which is uh, 5.1. So, to go uh, with the presenters this morning, in the list we had Roberto Belancur, Betancur uh, from um, Caracas, Venezuela, but last minute, um, he could not join the, the meeting, so we go uh, to the next presenter in our list, which, which is Peter Hutchins from OPCW. Peter is going to present uh, Resiliency and the OPCW Scientific Advisory Board, Tales of Providing Scientific Advice During a Pandemic. Please, Good morning, Peter. Peter. Hi, hopefully you can hear me okay. Let me... Good. Great, and hopefully you can see my slides okay. Yes. Great. Thanks. So um, I'm just going to show a slide or two to help me demonstrate uh, what I want to talk about. But for those of you who don't know, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons has a scientific advisory board made up of 25 esteemed experts from different states parties of the Chemical Weapons Convention. And they provide scientific advice to the Director General and the Technical Secretariat. And during normal times, of course, the SAB convenes in person in The Hague at least once a year, sometimes twice, to discuss science technology relevant to the CWC and the OPCW. As you can imagine, the COVID-19 pandemic has made this challenging. And in fact, the board has not met in person for about two years now. However, we've been able to adapt. And so what you can see here is what we've been able to do. We've been meeting virtually. We have held four sessions of the Scientific Advisory Board virtually using Microsoft Teams as a platform. And what we've had to do is instead of four to five day, whole day sessions, we have had to shorten those to about three to three and a half hours a day for either two or three days. The good news is the participation rate has been excellent. 
we either have all members of the board or almost all attend each of these virtual sessions. And it, they've been so successful actually that moving forward, even post pandemic, we uh, will incorporate virtual sessions in our SAB schedule moving forward. So we do not think we'll be moving back to purely in person sessions. And the reason for that is, as I quickly go here, there are some advantages to virtual meetings. One of these is that it's quite inexpensive to hold virtual meetings. <laughs> and so when budgets are a concern, we can still meet and, and do the and discuss topics of relevance quite easily. We can also have shorter meetings, which are quite quite convenient for our, our board members who have full time day jobs and it's quite hard sometimes to meet for an entire week out of their schedule. And the other thing that we found was it can be easier to accommodate external speakers. And so the board has been able to hear from some very esteemed uh, experts in various subjects who are able to dedicate an hour or a couple hours to brief the board. Whereas normally it would have been a challenge for them to dedicate several days to fly to the Hague, present, and then go back to their normal position. So given these things, uh, we've decided that moving forward, we're gonna be incorporating virtual meetings and this will make us more resilient and more able to um, anticipate and uh, have fruitful discussions and do good work no matter what happens moving forward. And so the rest of my slides, if you if you want to take a look, demonstrate some more of, of how that's going to happen and, and what prompted that. But thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. It was a nice continuation from the previous topic to, to that one. Thank you very much. And we stay with the uh, opposite demo view. Uh, Marta Galindo, welcome, Marta. Hello, hello everyone. Hello. Marta, it's a pleasure. All the PTS uh, staff, so uh, now uh, working for the OPCW, and uh, she will present um, implementing knowledge transfer processes, lessons learned from application in the OPCW. Please, Marta. Um, do you see my screen already? Almost. Safe charging. And I think I will try it again. Is it on? Next time. Nothing, because from my computer it say I am sharing. We we can see it, Marta. If if you share. Oh, okay, okay, super, super. So our poster is uh, from the knowledge management team in the OPCW, and we are presenting the lesson learned from the knowledge transfer process that we are applying at the OPCW. It's very interesting to know that the um, member states of the Chemical Weapon Convention has tasked the Technical Secretariat to implement knowledge management, to maintain the organization fit for purpose and make it a global repository of knowledge on the verification of the convention. For that- Sorry, Marty, could you, could you make your presentation full screen? Uh, I, ho I hope so. I don't know why I have difficulties. The whole thing has become a very, very small, a small page. So, sorry, I cannot do it. That's okay. Please continue. It's okay. So, but I will keep talking. So, in principle, the 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 thing is tasked by the member states. The TS is implementing continuous knowledge management to ensure the organization is fit for purpose. So, our. Uh, Presentation in the poster reflect the current three process that we are implementing. The, the, the one that exists in our regulation is the use of a knowledge transfer form. So we are just um, implemented uh, uh, once a year at the, um, at the uh, performance evaluation, the people have to 
write and task. And this process, when we evaluate it, it, has, it doesn't work properly. It's very stiff, it's very rigid, and we don't fulfill the process of having continuity in our business process. The second one is having living interviews. Prepare a, a plan for the people when it's departure to ensure we don't leave a knowledge gap in our core business area to ensure that all the critical knowledge, not the knowledge that the, the expertise is having, but the core that is fundamental for the operation of the OPCW is retained. And in 2021, we are introducing a new method uh, that is, uh, we define it as knowledge transfer session with experts, where we define trigger questions from the expertise to the design expert that either because it's changing function or is departing, is, is in the need to transfer the knowledge to this group of experts and it's working fine. So um, if you feel interested on knowledge transfer process and how it's working on the OPCW, please uh, visit the poster, contact me, or yeah, uh, however you feel it will be easier. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marta. Very important process of knowledge transfer. Um, thanks. I'll come to visit your poster. I have questions maybe for better uh, <laughs> understanding of how it works. Um, so for our next uh, next speaker will be from the CTBT Youth Group is Kirsch Tende Chirobe. And Kirsch will be presenting 25 years of CTBTO, progress with verification technologies and looking towards the future 25 years and beyond. Please, Kirsch. Do we have Kirsch with us? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Okay, let me share my presentation. Can you all see my presentation? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. So <clears throat> my presentation is titled 25 years of the CTBTO progress with verification technologies and looking towards the future and beyond. So basically what I was focusing on was the progress made from the day nuclear weapons detonation started and um, to where we are right now. So um, the major <coughs> milestones is that since the inception of the CTBTO, the nuclear weapons conducted by the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, six of them, all were detected. The first one was in 2006, another one in 2009, then uh, some in 2018 and also in 2016. All of them were detected by the stations which are part of the uh, verification regime of the CTBT. There are also other um, achievements which include uh, tsunami warnings in Japan as well as um, the announcement on uh, iodine 131 radiation. All of these have come from the verification regime. So that is what my presentation is all about, and I hope you are going to enjoy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kurt. Um, your poster surely will add to the very large uh, topics uh, that were discussed by the youth group during this SNT as well. Thank you very much. And the last presentation will be from the University of uh, Gajamada, Indonesia. Uh, it will be done by Jessica Natalia Chelsea. And Jessica will be presenting science and po policy, Bangkok Treaty from a scientific point of view. Please, Jessica. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? It's loading and we can see you. Okay. Uh, Hello, my name is Jessica and I'm from Indonesia. Today, I'm replacing our team speaker Arjuna to present our team study about the safety aspect of the Treaty of Southeast Asia Nuclear Weapon Free Zone or the Bangkok Treaty. To begin the presentation of our study, let's imagine a case together. What if a nuclear weapon explosion occurs near the border of our country? As we know, nuclear explosion releases fission products in the form of particles and gases, which will be carried by the wind. If it accumulates in the residence, the effect on human health, animals, and the environment will be massive. 
for human and animals, there will be an increase in cancerous and growth deformities. Also, there will be a mass mortality in trees and plants. Surely, in this peaceful time that has been regulated, right? Well, actually, no. The Bangkok Treaty prohibits any nuclear weapon activities from the member state within or beyond the EEZ of each member state. Sure, ASEAN countries do not possess any nuclear weapons. However, the treaty has zero regulation towards the non-member states who are more likely to conduct nuclear weapon tests outside the aforementioned zone. Uh, from this, the simulation that we conducted using, using high split, a nuclear explosion outside the zone will still severely impact humans and the environment as the radioactive particles from a nuclear explosion outside the zone are still deposited in some inhabited areas. As a, as a student from Indonesia, we are grateful to partake in this conference and represent our region folks, a nuclear disarmament that are relatively underrepresented. We are confident that our region's zero-tolerance approach towards the nuclear, the nuclear weapons can encourage other regions to follow suit. So please look at our poster. If you find it interesting, we will we will appreciate a fort. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica. And for sure, that should will trigger a discussion. Great. And so Thank you very much. now, uh, last but certainly not least, we have Edward Ift, who is going to present on a new threat to the CTBT. Please, Edward. Yes, good morning. It's uh, 4 a.m. in Washington, and I'm not sure I'm supposed to be here in this group, but, but here I am. I prepared an oral presentation on this subject, and it somehow ended up in the uh, e-poster bin, but it was suggested that I, I join this group and, and, and talk for a couple of minutes about what, what uh, my presentation says. The, the CTBT is under a new threat. The 2020 U.S. Compliance Report for the first time issued a finding that, quote, Russia has conducted nuclear weapons related experiments that have created nuclear yield and are not consistent with the U.S. zero yield standard, end quote. The report also says that Russia may be guilty of a violation of the 1990 Threshold Test Ban Treaty. These allegations are repeated in the 2021 Biden administration's compliance report, uh, which says that China may also be guilty of similar activities. Similar charges have been circulating in the US for years, but this is the first time that a finding has been made by the US intelligence community. The fact that U.S. charges of noncompliance by Russia resulted in the Trump administration's withdrawal from both the INF Treaty and the Open Skies Treaty indicates that this situation needs to be resolved urgently. No evidence has been presented for these charges, and the IMS has not reported any relevant evidence of such activities. The problem has at least four aspects. First, as everyone knows, Article 1 of the treaty prohibits nuclear explosions, but does not define that term. I think this is well understood. I and many other people have written about this. Secondly, in the no man's land between signature and entry into force, Article 18 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties prohibits acts that would defeat the object and purpose of the treaty. Third, there is a worldwide unilateral voluntary moratorium on nuclear explosions pending entry into force. And fourth, the US-Russia threshold test ban requires declarations in advance of any nuclear explosions. Um, I think I don't need to remind this audience that this is an issue that needs to be cleaned up urgently. And you can look at my oral presentation uh, for more details. Thank you. Thank you, Edward, for joining this uh, this discussion this uh, this morning. Uh, thank you very much. And the uh, audience can see, of course, your poster at the uh, e platform. Um, so that was the list that we had uh, list of presenters for uh, this session. Now I see we have some questions. Do we? 
So the first question that came in this morning is what is the difference? Uh, I think that what is it? What, are the, what is the difference between um, before and during the pandemic with the JST stations? So how are the problems different before and after or during the pandemic? And I think this was for Ronnie. Ronnie, are you still with us? Yeah, I'm here. So this was the question for the JST stations. This is from your presentation, correct? Uh, yeah, well, this is a uh, JTS station. Yeah, uh, the question is uh, how the how did he change the, the the well. Uh, mostly the presentation is about the, the um, how uh, I um, managed to. To get the, the station and uh, all all team uh, together for the session to work, but I didn't I didn't make any analysis or or, or the or the noise on the on the station, uh, uh, but still we have some some periodic noise on the GTS station that uh, that's uh, at low frequency. That we can see at this at this time, and we are now testing this. Uh, this uh, why we we see this this noise, uh, but um, also so important is the from from at this time some landslide and other things we can capture that uh, on the station that uh, perhaps on other time we were not able to to capture, but. Uh, that's it. That's it. What uh, I can say about that uh, JTS station. Great. Thank you very much, Ronnie. So the second question we received here relates to the knowledge transfer. So I believe this is for you, Marta. Uh, and the question is: Knowledge transfer mechanism seems like a useful tool to also identify training needs and gaps. Can you say a little more about how this transfer mechanism contributes to staff development? You, you have to unmute your microphone. Thanks a lot. So, depending on the mechanism that you do you use to do the knowledge transfer, you will identify different action plans that you have. So, when you interview a, a people living, you can define for the function that the person is doing. You can define the necessary training. You can define areas where there is no capability to do transfer with explicit knowledge and you need to do action like mentoring or defining training programs. So one of the big outcomes from doing your knowledge transfer is action plans on training and staff development. One of our recommendations from the living interviews is to define at the moment that um, you will post your next position, what are the necessary trainings that this person will need to do on the job for that particular function in the job? I hope I answered the question. It's a it's a it's a big field to define transfer plans for the for the actual uh, professional, and one big item of these transfer plans are the training and the staff development. And we, we always, knowledge management and human resources have to go hand to hand. So it has to be a, a full collaboration between the two groups. Thank you very much, Martha. Excellent, excellent points. I actually had a, a little bit of a follow-up on, on this question. Um, you discussed a little bit about the, uh, the, the exit interviews and uh, in, including experts in those discussions. And one of the things that uh, comes up to my mind is it, perhaps there is a bit of assumed knowledge um, when when staff are leaving these organizations. Uh, but for people coming in, of course, that institutional knowledge or assumed knowledge isn't necessarily there. So how can you address that gap? We try to have redundancy on the way to do the function to ensure not only knowledge transfer, but business continuity. And consistency in the approach of doing the things. 
So in principle, um, it's important that any uh, there is no function that is, is performed by a unique staff in such a way that when this person leaves, these functions get into a gap and they are not picked up until the next one comes. We know that in this um, organization with tenure policy, there is not overlap between the function. Uh, as such, there is not overlap between the professional in general. But we have to ensure that the functions are well performed in a way that they are redundant. So in the transfer plans, we try to identify, and this is the most important part of the, of the plans, the functions that are performed collectively by the group and the functions that are performed unique by the staff that is living and minimize the possibility that uh, there is a gap in their performance. The ones that can be documented, then uh, the important is to make the knowledge explicit. And in some cases, we have even suggested that when the new person is on board, for, uh, for tacit knowledge that the previous uh, staff had, to bring the person and have it maybe a month together on the job. Not, not trying to have uh, both at the same time, that this we know is impossible, but propose to bring the other person. And this has happened in particularly at the OPCW lab for, with the head of the lab. So they have the possibility to converse and work together for a certain period. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for that, Marcia. Appreciate it. Uh, yes, thanks, Mark, also. And uh, at the same time, I was multitasking and trying to read a question that came to the the chat here in our discussion, but it's so small. I'll try to read it. Okay. Don't, don't, don't uh, like it, please. Yeah, it's easy. Uh, so the question will go probably, uh, not probably to you, uh, Jessica. And uh, John Spat is asking, in regards to the Bangkok Treaty, do member states have claim beyond the 200 nautical miles as per UNCLOS? Uh, I don't know if we are muted or. Uh... Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so for for the easy uh, member states do do not have any claim beyond the two hundred miles. But considering the health impacts, I think it can be a good foundation for nuclear weapons test prohibition. Maybe that's my answer. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, and the second question in the same chat comes from uh, Umar Afebua from Nigeria. And the question is, were there feasible changes with respect to data transmission to IDC from various IMS stations during the pandemic? So uh, it's, uh, I believe this question can be addressed by any of you. It's about that transmission from the station to IDC and how it was affected. Perhaps just pass, maybe you could comment on this. Uh, yes, uh, let me comment on this in regards to our IMS station KMBO. And the answer is a simple yes, because uh, the problems we have at KMBO are not IMS related. They are mainly GCI related. So every time the GCI fails, so most of the time the, the GCI may fail, but IMS is working. The, the, the sensors are working, the workstations are working, the digitizers are working. Of course, there'll be data buffering, but if it exceeds, uh, for example, the seven day limit, then most of the data would be lost. And that obviously would lead to uh, data gaps and outages. So I don't know whether I've answered it correctly. Yes, uh, thank you for that's the situation exactly you address it. That is buffering data. If the station is uh, uh, collecting, receiving and collecting data, if there is an outage on the GCI, of course, 
it will be buffered afterwards. And uh, we have had a couple of cases like this, but uh, thank you very much. So I have a, a question for, for Peter from the OPCW talking about the uh, scientific advisory board and moving to well, well, doing a, a mostly virtual format, but now looking forward to a more hybrid format. Um, my question relates to the impact of having more regular sessions or meetings of the SAB. Um, how does that affect the gen agenda? How does it affect uh, decision making and how does it affect the participation in these meetings? Yeah, thanks. I participation has been great and I expect it to continue to be. Our board is very committed uh, to its its work and its scientific advice. In terms of agenda, I think there'll be a little more juggling in terms of you know, how do we prioritize what what topics or what uh, types of things we should do in person versus virtually? And so we already know what some of those might be. For example, getting uh, updates from the technical secretariat that may be confidential or otherwise sensitive are best to do in person. Whereas, as I mentioned earlier, there's certain external speakers or topics that we can easily tackle virtually as well. So it, it will, we will have to, I would say prioritize, but categorize um, what we want to talk about a little bit more than we would otherwise. But I, in general, I still see it as, as a net positive in terms of how we're going to be able to operate. And uh, in terms of the frequency, I think it, it, it should be it should be good. Uh, even now, the SAB is able to render advice intercessionally. I think having a, a, an, an extra session or two a year in virtual format will help keep our our pulse on on the topics and the things we need to do. And so I see that as a positive as well. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Peter. I have a, a question for uh, Professor if, if, uh, if you don't mind. Um, you outlined quite a few uh, challenges and, and threats to the CTBT in your in your uh, presentation, um, specifically with regard to the new assessments or the judgments by the uh, intelligence community in the United States. Um, so, my question is, what are the steps that can be taken to resolve some of these challenges, uh, of course, without entry into force? Yes, that that is the real question. Um, <clears throat> the U.S. says that it has tried to raise some of these issues in the P5 without success. Uh, whether it's been discussed bilaterally with the Russians uh, is not clear. Um, basically, the reason I'm alarmed is that there, there is a, simil a disturbing similarity between this situation and what happened with the INF Treaty, which was that um opponents of arms control and skeptics of arms control began, began to say more than 10 years ago that there were violations occurring i'm talking about the inf treaty and some meetings were held and the americans would make the charge and the russians would say we don't know what you're talking about show us the evidence the Americans would say, you know perfectly well what we're talking about, and uh, we got nowhere. Uh, and the result was we lost the INF Treaty. If this issue is not cleaned up, it's going to be very damaging to the CTBT, in my view. I mean, if, if some country is cheating and this continues, the U.S. will not ratify the treaty, and it will never enter into force. That should raise alarm bells, seems to me, for, for everyone. Um, what did not happen to the INF Treaty was that people should have been banging on doors in both Washington and Moscow saying, we don't know what's going on, but this treaty is important to us, and we want it settled. Um, that did not happen, and we lost the treaty. And it looks like we're going down the same road for the CTBT. I do suggest in my presentation and in a paper I wrote in the journal Survival last year that I think there are some compromises that, uh, that could get us out of this problem. 
Thank you very much, Professor. I uh, can only hope that uh, some of the decision makers and policy makers are also reading some of these papers that you're writing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again, and thank you to all. Um, we are basically at the end of our session on the round table. Thank you very much uh, to all of you for uh, those presentations, for your posters, your contribution, for the audience uh, for listening to us. Uh, don't forget to visit uh, those places on the V platform and also there are the rooms, the virtual rooms where discussions can continue while the, uh, this uh, discussion is over. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much for organizing this, uh, this interesting uh, topic. Okay. Thank you very much. And ciao, Marta. <laughs>